right, so this is 1.2 extra practice that we needed to complete before we start 1.3. Okay, so in section 1.2, what we're doing is uh, talking about learning, answering questions of, of a function based upon a table rather than an equation. 1.1 was an equation, 1.2 is a table. So on Monday, when we're given a table, and this one happens to be a horizontal table, which is my function and which is my variable? Okay, good job. You were listening. Variable is always on top. Function is always on bottom. Now, I made this error in my 930 class, and I'm not going to do it in this class. So I went straight to defining it. But before I do that, I'm going to actually now take the time to read the problem so I know what these numbers represent. All right, in a town whose population is 2,000, a disease creates an epidemic. Yeah, we've all lived through that, right, 2020? The number of people in infected T days after the disease has begun is given by. Okay, how would I write that in functional notation? What's the functional notation I would use? N at T. N at T, that's correct. So there's your functional notation. So now what we're going to do is we're going to define each of those. So I'm going to define the function. That can be found in what I just read, or it's right there on the table. So it's what's on bottom. There's my N. That is the number of people infected. So N is number of people infected. So then my variable, we know it's always what's inside the parentheses, which is T. And I'm just going to go straight over here to the table. And it says days after outbreak. So defining function and variable should be pretty easy on a table because they have it for you right there. Probably the biggest error is if students get it mixed up, but variable always goes on top of it. All right, so how many people are initially infected? So we've been talking about this word right here. What does initially mean? No days have passed. So this is when T equals zero. So we are... Because of this word initially, we're given the variable, it's asking for the function. So in at zero days, and I go up to my table, and is that value given? Yes. So we have 96 what? People, yeah, people, people infected. infected. Either way. Yeah. If people are infected, those are infected people. So I would take that. All right. What is the average rate of change? Okay. This was the new thing that we learned on Monday. So anytime you see average rate of change or average might be worded a little bit different, then you know that you need to use average rate of change formula. So what is the average rate of, rate of change per day in the number of people infected from day three to six? So one way you might see it notated is this way as well, three to six days. You don't have to put that. If you don't put that, I won't count it off, but I just wanted to point that out. All right, so what is that formula? The change in the function over the change in the variable, and we are talking about three to six, so we're looking right here on the table. All right, so change in function, that's the 466 and the 1,296. What do I do with those two numbers? Subtract, which number goes first? Yeah, remember we go backwards. 
So we have 1,296 minus 466 over six minus three. Now, you, if you want, if you prefer, you are more than welcome to subtract that and you're gonna get 830 people infected over three days. That was what we called a rate, but ultimately for the average rate of change, we want the unit rate, which we know it's a unit rate when what occurs? It's over one. The denominator has to be one. That's a unit rate. That's what we express our average rate of change in. All right, so I'm going to go to my calculator. And again, to get to the fraction button, alpha y equals one. And I'm going to put in 1,296 minus 466 over six minus three. And notice it gives me a decimal. Well, it would be that decimal over one. So if we get a just a number on there, we know that the denominator is always one. We're going to go ahead and round to two decimal places. So it'd be 276.67. All right. Now, if you give me this as your answer on a test, I'll give you part of the credit or points, but I'm not going to give you full credit or points. I will be very picky and I expect you to label. So the top number is your change in function and our function is people infected. Our denominator, six minus three, that's your variable. That is one what? Day. So basically this is saying from three to six days, this is how many people are infected per day. So if I wanted the number of people infected on day four, I would take 466, add this number, and that would give me day four. Day five, I would add that number again. Day six, I would add that number, and it should be that or very close to it since we rounded. It may not be exact, okay? All right, part C, what does N at five mean? Okay, what does it mean? It means we're doing an explain. We're gonna explain N at five. All right, so I want an explain in sentence form. So N represents what? Yeah, we've got it here. We've got it here. So I'm going to say the number of people infected So we've defined what N is. What does 5 mean? After, <laughs> 5 days after outbreak. <laughs> And then typically we'd say is, and then we would give a number, but I don't have that number yet, do I? Yeah. No. That's what it's asking me to do in the second part. Now it's asking me to estimate it because I don't have five on the table, but I do know five is between three and six. So we learned, we did this on Monday. So to estimate it, we're going to start at the number of people infected on day three and add to it, well, day five would be two more days. And what do I do with that two? My average rate of change. Yep, because we're going to get 276.67 per day and we want that for two. So technically what we're doing is in place of N at three, I get this number from the table, 466 plus two times 276.67. So you guys calculate that and tell me what value you get. 
And what are we talking about? What is it? Uh, people infected. People infected. Mm -hmm. So now I can put this number up here in my sentence. And now my explain is complete. Okay. All right, part D. Does this function have a limiting value? Meaning does it, remember how I think it was yeast problem and it went 662, 664, 665, 665, 600. So we had a limiting value. So where would you look first for a limiting value? Okay, that you went there first. I would probably typically look at the table myself. So in my haste, I would go, oh, all my answers are found at the table. So I would go, okay, it's increasing, but it doesn't, I mean, it's slowing down, but it'll probably keep going on and on and on. But as Samantha noticed, it said this right here. So if it's a town of 2,000, is it gonna go over 2,000? No. 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 So in this case, yes, there is a limiting factor. It's because the population of the town is 2,000. So even if everybody in town was infected, it's not going to go above that. That's true. I'm going to guess if you have a whole town that's infected with something, they're not going to get very many visitors. <laughs> yeah. All right. Two is a completely different question. So it doesn't have anything to do with that name. Calculate C at six if this is given. All right, so C at six, 1.3 plus 2.85 E to the negative 0.37. And in place of that T, we're going to put six. All right, plug that into your calculator. Let me know what you get. Round to two decimal places. And then if you don't get the answer we do, Please ask after class. I had a student, my other class asked, and it was an easy fix. So okay. all right, yes. Okay. The E button. <laughs> No, that's your point. This is uh -huh. okay. this will give the answer to that. This will give the answer. Uh do they tell us? All right, does anybody want to tell me what they got? And then we'll see if, or you have a question or are you going to tell me? Oh, uh, 1.61. All right, do I have that confirmed or does somebody get something else? Yes. All right, 1.61 is correct. Now, somebody asked, do we need to label that? Which is a great question, which means also I've been harping on it enough that y'all know I'm going to look for that. That's a good thing. They don't give us any information what this is. But I will ask you, what is the function? C, what's the variable? T. So in asking the question, if I said all I want you to give me is functional notation for this question, what would that be? Yeah. B at six. Okay. All right. Now, before we go on to 1.3, I want to pull a question that was on or that is on WebAssign. <laughs> It's number 10, the last one. Now, we're not going to work the whole problem, but there's a few things that might have been confusing for students, okay? So I just want to hit on that, and then if you have additional questions, feel free to talk to me after class. All right, so they give us a table. 
Of course, this one's vertical, not horizontal. So I know this is my variable and this is my function and this is P at H. And then of course, even though I didn't ask for it, I very likely would on a test, you'd go ahead and define the function, which is temperature, define the variable. And this is what I want you to notice. H is hours since 4 p.m. So when H is zero, what time is it? So this is four o'clock. So when H is one, what time is it? Five. Now it's five o'clock. Because this is hours. So four o'clock plus one o'clock is five o'clock. So of course, then we know this is six o'clock, seven o'clock, and eight o'clock. So I think they have a question where they ask you like in between. Like if they say 530, well, 530 is halfway between five and six. So that would be one and a half hours since four. Okay. So that's one thing I want to point out. Okay. So then down here, it asks for the average decrease per minute. So they're asking you to calculate the average rate of change, anytime you see that word average, okay? Now, I'm gonna throw a number out here. It is not the correct answer numerically, because I'm not gonna work it out. I'm just going to make up a number and then explain what I want you to understand. Let's say that I did the change in the function over the change of the variable, and I get like negative 0 0.12 degrees over one hour. Again, that's not the answer. So don't put that in, into your web assignment assignment, okay? Now, this said the word decrease, right? So what happened here that goes, oh, that's why it represents decrease, the negative, okay? But here's what most students do, and I get it. I probably would have done it the first attempt myself, is to put negative 0.12 degrees per minute over here. Whoops, minute, not hour. <laughs> Oh, that's one thing. It wants minutes. So you may have to do some adjustment there. Mm -hmm. The time interval. So this would be 60 minutes. This would be 120 minutes, right? So that means when you do the change in variable in the denominator, you're not going to do like 2 minus 1. You're going to have to do it with minutes. Mm -hmm. I just noticed that. Okay, so that's one thing. All right, so... This word right here set is telling us we know it's decreasing. How much is it de decreasing by? 0.12 degrees per minute. So you don't put the negative here because they've already stated they know it's a decrease. If I say it's decreasing a degree outside, if it's 92 right now, then you're not going to tell me it's negative something, right? You're going to say it degree decreased by one degree, not decreased by negative one degree, okay? So that's just something. And I just caught that on per minute. And I didn't, so you guys got an additional hint my 930 class did not get. So is that helpful on that one? Okay, again, if you have more questions than that, feel free to ask me after class. Okay, before we go on to 1.3. So, our unit quiz is over 1.1 and 1.2. Typically, I would say we're going to do this on Monday, but we don't have class on Monday. I don't want to wait till Wednesday. All right. So your unit quiz is going to be Friday. It will cover only section 1.1 and 1.2. So we're going to... Once I get done with this, we're going to start looking at 1.3. That will not be on the quiz, okay? All right, then I believe somebody in this class asked how many questions are there. There's only two questions, but realize just like this problem is one question, but it has several parts to it. So that same thing's going to happen. So typically A, B, C, D, E. So there's five parts to each one. So technically there's 10 things you're going to have to answer. Right? Two questions of podcasts. 
Correct. So if it's only over two questions, that would lead me to believe more than likely one of the questions is going to be over 1.1 and one question is going to be over 1.2, right? What was the difference between these? Well, in 1.1, we looked at functions as a what? Equation or formula? I'm just going to make something up. So if I gave you Q at H equals 19.1 plus um, 2E raised to the 0.1H. I don't know. I'm just making something up. Okay. Questions I might ask. I might ask, what's the function? What's the variable? So you have to tell me the function and define it. The variable and define it. Um, you may be asked a question about how it was initially. So you need to know that's when the variable is zero. Um, you might, then you'll probably, I'll give you a number for H. So I might say, you know, what is it in three something? So you would calculate Q at three. You'd give me that number. And then, of course, look for me to say, explain what that means. And that would be in sentence form. So those are all the different things that we've answered for 1.1, okay? Then you're going to have another or question, and that's going to deal with 1.2. Therefore, we're going to be looking most likely as a function in the form of what? A table. So again, <clears throat> I'll be looking for you to be able to define the function and the variable. You need to be able to read the table. You need to, if I say what does... Um, you know, R at three me, you'd have to write it out in words, or you may have to um, give me that value, meaning you got to go to the table and be able to read it, and then expect me to ask a question about the average rate of change from the table as well, okay? So, <clears throat> just to give you a little heads up and idea of what you will be seeing on the quiz. Now, on Friday, <clears throat> I will lecture for a little bit and then I will get you'll get a minimum of 30 minutes for those two questions. Okay. All right. 1.1 1. 1, formula equation. 1.2 is from a table. 1.3 being able to read and uh and evaluate functions based upon a graph. Okay, so this goes back to page one when we talked about the four ways. Yes, ma'am. Can you do what? Expand. Oh, I didn't even know there was a fan over there. So yes, you can do that. All right, so we've looked a little bit with graphs. Let me take a trip. Right. Still not often. Okay, so on a graph, you have a horizontal axis and you have a vertical axis. This is your horizontal, this is your vertical. <clears throat> this is also known as the x-axis when you were first learning things in algebra. This is the y-axis. But we're not in an algebra class, we're in a functions class. What are the two things that we always identify? Variable and, variable and function. So what we need to know is that the function is always on the vertical axis. The variable is always on the horizontal axis. Now, y'all, I said always. There's not a lot of things that you can say always or never about. But always, always, always. Function, variable never changes. Okay. All right. So we're given this graph. And from what we just stated, then I know this represents my function and this represents my variable. Now we're going to label it even more specifically. So we're going to read through the problem. We're going to define the variable and the function, and then we're going to label those axes based upon that, okay? So 
The graph in the figure below is taken from the website of the wedding report. It shows the number of weddings in millions in the year Y. Okay, so what is my functional notation based upon what was given? What is my function? Which one? W or Y? W, always. Variable is always, always, always in the parentheses. <clears throat> okay, so then I'm going to go looking to see what W represents. So when you look above, what would you define as W? Weddings. And we know we're talking millions. Now that I'm dealing with the graph, I've defined my function. I'm going to go over here and define that axis. So W is my function. And that is number of weddings in millions. And I'm just going to put abbreviate millions in parentheses. So that way, now when I look at this vertical axis, I see a two. Well, I know that doesn't represent two weddings. It means two million weddings. Okay, that's a lot of weddings. All right, so what is my variable? which we're calling Y. Now, notice it's not years since a particular date. Mm -hmm. And when I look, they give me the year. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to do Y comma year. Now, part A, we've actually already answered. It says, which quantity is the function? Well, we've already defined that. So we know that that the function is W, and I'm gonna just go ahead and rewrite that, even though we've done it. I'm gonna put it here on the question. Could be millions of weddings, weddings is the wedding, okay? All right, part B says find W at 1970, okay? So before you go up and look at the graph, this is in functional notation. What did they give me, the function or the variable? The variable. It's in the parentheses, so we were given the variable. You may be asked some questions. What's given, variable or function? So you've got to be able to read it and know. It's in the parentheses, so we know that we are given the variable. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to locate 1970. And then I'm going to travel upward. So that tells me that W at 1970 equals, and what's nice, it falls between two and two and a half, but they give me the exact number above. So 2.16 uh, wedding. Million weddings. weddings. That's a lot of weddings. All right. C. When was the number of weddings 2.34 million? What was given, function or variable? Function. 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 Yeah. Variables the year. They didn't give me a year. They told me the number of weddings. <clears throat> so they gave us the function. All right. So I'm going to go find 2.34, which is right here. So that was in 1995. So I would probably go W at 1995 equals 2.34 million. Of course, what is it asking for? It's asking for this. If you gave me just 1995, that would be fine because it didn't 
say the word explain so you could you wouldn't have to give it to me in sentence form but, okay when were the number of weddings increasing okay so now we're looking at a graph when we looked at the table we would look and see that the numbers would go up which you can look at this as well as well as because they gave the numbers but if they didn't give the numbers i could still tell where it's increasing just based upon how this curve is going. Obviously going up is increasing, going down is decreasing. So when I start, I'm going, okay, it's going up 1945 to 50. So then it starts going down. So my first one is 1945 to 50. I would write that. Then it starts going down, continues. Looks like it's horizontal, but it actually goes down. And then it appears to start going up again. So my second part of my answer would be 1962. It's going up. It's still going up. And then it starts going down. So I'd say 1960 to 1970. And then it goes down. Oh, it's going up again. So starting at 1975, it goes up. It goes up. It goes up. So that's to 1990. And then it appears the rest of the way it goes down. So what do we say? 1950 to 1960? What was the second one? 1940 to 1960. Oh, 45, sorry. 45 to 1950. That was the first one. Okay, what was the next one? 1960 to 1960. 60 to 70? Mm -hmm. And then what was the last one? Nineteen ninety. Okay, thanks. All right. Then you would go through and you would do the same thing for decreasing. So it increases. So we're starting then at nineteen fifty. Goes down, goes down to nineteen sixty. Then it starts going up, and then it hits nineteen seventy. And it goes down to 75. And then it starts going up, up, up. And then at 1990 to when? 2020. So that's just recognizing increasing and decreasing. All right. When? Did the number of weddings reach its highest point? Now, notice they didn't give me a year. They didn't give me any kind of number. What did they give me? What wording is something that they go, oh, that was given? Number of weddings. Yes, because what wording here? Highest point. So if I look for where it's the highest point, what was what was given to me? Function or variable? Function. And they're asking me to find variable. All right, what is the highest point? Is it 2.44? Yeah. So here's the tallest one. And some of y'all have already told me that's 1990, and that was found by just looking down that way. So it's 1990. <clears throat> All right, that means we're gonna to need to do some calculating, right? Average rate of change. So that means we're going to do the average rate of change and it tells me to do that from 1970 to 1980. So we know the rate of change between the two, we can just look up and subtract them, but that's over a 10 year period. So what we wanna know is what was occurring per year, okay? So I'm gonna come up here and I'm gonna locate those two. So here's 1970 and 1980. So those are the numbers that we're looking at. I'm going to go ahead and write again the change in function over the change in 
variable. Is this how you want to do the test like that? You don't have to write this on the test, but I will show you what you do have to write or what I highly recommend. Okay, so change of function. If you remember when we went to the table, we went backwards on the table to subtract those values. Now we're doing it from a graph. So do you think, in the, here's my function numbers here, right? Will we do 2.16 minus 2.39 or 2.39 minus 2.16? Yep. We're going to go backwards on this as well. So that would be 2.39 minus 2.16 plus 1980 to 1970. Now, again, if you wanted to subtract those and then put whatever the number is over 10 um, years, you can do that. Or you can just go to your calculator and get the unit rate because that's what we want, the unit rate. So again, alpha y equals 1. 2.39 minus 2.16 over 1980 minus 1970. Now, what did I do wrong? Oh, look, I did 19 points. I don't have 1970. I mean, that's a weird answer. Oh, you guys can't see. Look at the weird answer I got. And so I looked back at what I entered. I didn't enter 1970. Okay, so what did you guys get? Zero, 0. 0. 0. 0. 0.023. What do we put in the denominator? One. Okay, so let's talk about what we're talking about. 0. 0.023 million people, right? No, million weddings. Per one year. Okay. Erica, you had the question. Uh, so if this were a test question, you don't have to write these numbers here if you don't want to. Okay? I'm not going to count off if you don't, if you do, that's great. You don't have to write this. I highly recommend that you write this and then give me the answer. If you didn't write any of this and you accidentally miscalculated, this is going to be wrong. I can't give you any partial credit. But if I have this to go off of, I can find where your error is and hopefully give you some partial credit. And if you got this right and this wrong, it tells me you did a calculator error. So does that answer your question? Okay, perfect. All right, so now we're getting into graphs. So there's some conversations about graphs that you're gonna need to be able to have and to be able to recognize and tell me what's going on. So you're gonna have some graphs that will be increasing. Here's a quick look at some that you might see. A straight line, although we don't deal with those a lot, those can, can occur. You could have a graph increasing that looks like this. You could have a graph that is increasing that looks like this. So those these two have different curvatures. We're going to be dealing with some graphs that may be decreasing. So straight line, again, we won't see a lot of that, but that can occur. You could see a curvature that looks like this or a curvature that looks like this. Those are all considered decreasing graphs. And then you may encounter where a graph or a portion of the graph is constant. I thought that's what we had like right here. 
until I looked at the numbers, they were a little different. But what if these were both 1.53, 1.53? What type of line would that be right there? Horizontal. It's constant graph, but it's a horizontal line, meaning it doesn't go up or down. All right, now with our graphs, we're going to need to recognize and locate what are called the maximum and minimum points. So down here, we have two examples. We've already talked about increasing and decreasing. So if I asked you to label this increasing or decreasing, we go, okay, from left to right, this part of it is increasing. This part of the graph is decreasing. This part of the graph is increasing. Going up, increasing, going down, decreasing, going up, increasing. On this one, reading from left to right, it starts going down. So we know this is decreasing. Then here it is increasing. Then it decreases again. And then its little tail is increasing. So that would be recognizing what the graph's doing. If I asked you to label one, that's what I would be looking for. Okay. All right. Now what we want to do is be able to define or locate what are called our maximum and or our minimum. So the definition of a maximum, it occurs where a graph changes from increasing to decreasing. This is your maximum. Y'all, it's basically the top of the hill. So this is changing from increasing to decreasing. This is the top of the hill. That's considered a maximum. Here I have increasing to decreasing, so it hits a, a point at the top. This would be your maximum. Then we have a minimum, and that's when it changes from decreasing to increasing. Basically, it's the bottom of the valley. Okay, so decreasing, it hits a point and then it starts increasing. This is what we call a minimum. So here it would occur in this valley and again in this valley. Okay, so that's increasing, decreasing, minimum and maximum. Most of you all have seen those. Students don't typically have any difficulty uh, being able to identify that. What you may not have seen in your background that sometimes is a little bit more difficult to recognize and that is concavity. So we will look at graphs and I'll wanna know, hey, when is it concave up? When is it concave down? What parts of the graph are concave up? What parts of the graph are concave down? Okay, so. Let me give you some examples of concave up. This would be an example if I had a graph that was doing this. Now, what is, is this graph increasing or decreasing? <laughs> decreasing. So the graph is decreasing. And then I would want to know it's concavity. Well, to me, the easiest way to determine or identify its concavity is if you were to extend this, it appears that it would start doing this and it has a, it looks like a cup and I think of cups up, right? So if you're at a restaurant, if you have your coffee cup up, that means you want coffee. If you turn it down, you don't want coffee. So I think of cups up and cups down. So this is cups up. So this right here has a concavity of up, all right? Let me give you another example. Suppose we have this graph. Now here, is this increasing or decreasing? This one is actually increasing. If I were to draw a cup, this is also a cup up, so this would be concave up as well. So this is where you have to be careful. I have some students that think, oh, 
If the graph's increasing, it's always concave up. And if the graph is decreasing, it's always concave down. Well, you can see that's not true because this is decreasing and it still has concavity of up. So you have to be careful with that. All right, so if I drew this increasing or decreasing, this is increasing. But if I were to extend this to draw a cup, now I'm saying I don't want coffee. My cup is down. This is considered concave down. This graph is decreasing. But again, if I were to draw the cup, it would be cups down. So that would represent concave down. Okay. Okay, so in notes, that's where we're going to stop. So let me turn this off and then say a couple of things before I let you go.